Chapman, God will use through leadership. Because what did I say leadership is? Leadership isn't simply standing in the forefront. Leadership is exerting influence in this world for the furtherance of God's purpose. That's what leadership is. Leadership means that God can count on you for His church. times have taught all of us that okay lean on your own understanding if a guy likes a girl why don't you just get together well as we have seen the purpose of God regarding marriage is beyond just a man or a woman meeting their own needs but we are learning to walk in the awareness and the manifestation of what is true of us Amen. by agreement with God. Amen. What is true of you must become true to you. Amen. Because as long as there is a disparity between what is true of you with what is true to you, there will be some areas wherein we're not experiencing what already belongs to us. And this meeting is here to rectify that. So let's lift up our holy hands and we'll pray in the Holy Spirit. Samula Kanto Skuskuna Dantate O Melambro da Tengo Singa Nimba Bravosa Reka Mani Nemesem Reka Namani and Daha Daha Data Sungara La Paracansa. Thank you, Lord. Songale Pamela Nasia Sabarakima Mangadango de Gavaro Vosgaita Hambra Dakema. We thank you, Eternal Father, for this is the appointed time of the unveiling of your Son. Behold what was always true of us.
and as we behold him we shall be changed our form will resemble his but we are conformed to the Christoform we thank you for this time of transformation transfiguration metamorphosis thank you for harmonization of the outside with the inside all glory is yours eternal father in Christ Jesus your son our Lord amen, amen. well do something for me greet as many people as you can I honor the Christ in you all. Glory to God. Abba, dear Father. In launching this seminar, we examine the new laws for the new people in the new economy. And we saw that in the New Testament, there are several laws and the term law is used here not in a juridical sense but in an organic sense these laws pertain to life they they refer to that which vitally governs us in the new way of being human. For instance, the law of Genesis refers to an organic principle. All things perpetuate according to their own kind. So like begets like. Cats give birth to kittens. Dog give birth to puppies and to be born from above means that we now participate in the nature that is heavenly we are identified with divinity we are heirs of the divine nature we are consociated with the Godhead. Amen. We are associated Amen. with the Son of God. Amen. So that would imply, as he is, so are we in this world. Amen. Not as he was 2,000 years ago, and not as we will be one day in the street by and by. The power of the gospel is found in its tenses and prepositions. And when we study in the right tense, we find that there are many communications of gospel logic that are from God's eternal perspective. They are complete from the very first moment they are mentioned and that completion goes on into the future and there is no scenario irrespective of circumstances where those things that God calls complete are altered or changed in any way this refers to God's immutable truth versus man's changing opinions. 
You cannot be against the truth. You can only be for the truth. And the truth does not become true when you believed it. But by believing in that which is true, subjectively, you can now experience it. Because the experiential is the experimental. And we'll be examining that today. So we looked at the law of Christ. Which refers to how we relate with every category of humanity. Our mandate has commissioned us to all humanity. You see, there's no way you can receive this Catholic gospel and not see the universal scope of the saving act of Christ. The Apostle Paul said, upon receiving this revelation, he was made a debtor to all men. Because what he saw in Christ includes, involves, and describes God's eternal purpose for every human being. And you've probably heard of spiritual rights, of human rights rather. You've heard of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And you do not do anything to earn a right. It's already yours, whether you knew it or not. Well, there are certain spiritual rights every human being has. And it is the foremost spiritual right of every human being to hear the gospel. Apostolically delivered. Apostolically disseminated. Apostolically exegeted. Apostolically transmitted. So what does that mean? It means we're going to be sent into all, uh, onto all the categories of humankind. In their cultures, in the context of their religious beliefs, their ideologies. And the law of Christ means you learn to relate with them from the vantage point of incarnational ministry. You can descend to their level and communicate at their wavelength. And we learn to bear each other's burdens. By the agape of Christ, we cover faults. We distinguish between men's performances and behaviors from their identity. That's fulfilling the law of Christ. We saw the law of faith. The law of faith excludes all human boasting Because every act of God is already completed by Him. You cannot take credit for what is already done. But you can learn to celebrate what is already done. Listen to this. The economy of grace implies that whatever grace is, is already given. 
You cannot achieve it. You cannot earn it. The only thing you can do, once acknowledged, is to celebrate it. That's what it means to be forgiven. To be given something ahead of time. So grace was given to you beforehand. that you are waiting on God to do which are already completed by the law of faith we look unto Jesus the author and finisher of faith So we are not as the Old Testament brethren in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. We're not waiting for something to happen. We're not waiting for promises to be fulfilled. To us, the promises of God are yea and amen. And let me announce to you what that means. It means that all the promises of God are statements of your existence. Abba Father. How can I say this? The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is called the fulfillment of the promise and promises that God made unto the fathers. So you need to begin to acknowledge by the law of faith that you enter into the rest of God's own persuasion. There's no boasting in what you can achieve when we are referring to what has already been done. Thank you, Lord. There's a law of perfect liberty which deals with the intent of our hearing and practicing undivided focus to the image reflected in the mirror. Christ Jesus is the archetype icon. And the archetype became the prototype. And we are the replication of the prototype. So he says, do not, give in, do not give yourself to anger or wrath when you face different situations and circumstances. For wrath or anger is a defilement. The overflow of anger will lead to more wickedness. And in many ways we can transmutate our anger. That's what the Apostle Paul said when he said, be angry and sin not. The things we can be angry at. That's the true definition of wrath. God's wrath is his displeasure in us identifying with what we are not. The original sin, if you want to call it that, 
borrowing an Augustinian term, but I'll put it into another context. The original sin is the sin against origins. When you do not take into account that you descend from the genealogy of God, that God is the progenitor of your genes, that you're fathered by God. When you think contrary to who you are, by virtue of whose you are, you've forgotten the Genesis face. You've forgotten what manner of man you are. But by the perfect law of liberty, with undivided attention, we gaze into the prototypical image of the sun and with awareness that as he is, so are we. Blessed are we in everything that we do. So I don't become frustrated by what's happening around me. I learn that my awareness is manifestation. My awareness is manifestation. In other words, the, terminolo the terminology of this good news means that what we announce is already news before we announced it. So any of you waiting to be anything means you're not paying attention to what I'm saying. You're not waiting to be righteous. You're not waiting to become a son of God. You're not waiting to be healed. You're not waiting to be prosperous. You're not waiting to have a full supply. Awareness is manifestation. So if my attention is fixed undividedly on the image of the sun, which is the mirror of what I am in him. And if I look upon that image with a single eye, not with duality, I'm going ahead of myself. In explaining sin, the Lord Jesus said, that it would be better for you to pluck out an eye and it would be better for you to cut off your hand so that you can enter into the kingdom of God. You need to pluck out duality and you need to exclude external works to think that you are the one to make the kingdom of God manifest. You're not the one producing the kingdom of God. You're not the one making it happen. It's already happening. We're participating in what is already happening. You need to stop seeing double. I said you need to stop seeing double. Stop seeing that, okay, I'm in Adam and in Christ. Stop saying, well, I am cursed and blessed and blessed and cursed. You need to have a single eye. It's time to forget who you thought you were and embrace what God says you are and pluck out the eye and cut off your hand and know that it's not by seeing double. And it's not the work of my hands that's going to produce it. I'm taking part of something that's already happening. Thank you. Lord. 
So the fifth law, the fifth law is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So we're going to examine Romans chapter 8 from verse 1 to 6. And then I will introduce this and I'll, be, I'll give a more detailed background from chapter 7 tomorrow. Because as we begin from chapter 7, we find a more detailed background for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. But for tonight, we're going to lay the foundation in explaining what this law is. There is therefore, there is, is, is italicized. So it means therefore, now. Interesting. Now is the only time zone in which you should ever live. For too long, Christians have been taught to live in a state of expectation. So we've been waiting, thinking that better times are ahead. Guess what a future expectation robs you of? It robs you of what is in the now. And when you focus on the future, you're missing the now. See, some people get robbed by the past. Some people get robbed by the future. Some people are so preoccupied over what is to come, or sometimes they anticipate so much what is to come that they miss out in the present. And there are those who are in such regret over what happened or in such uh, admiration over what happened that they miss out in the present. The only, the only time zone in which you should live is in the now. We're not living in the bondage of chronological time. We use chronological time to be effective in this world. However, we are not confined by chronological time, which is in a sense illusory in itself. Therefore now, so just remove there is. It says the following, therefore now, no condemnation. Therefore now, no condemnation. What if I were to tell you? That our apostolic mandate includes the recovery of the original faith from Western theology. My father. My father. My father. Let me elaborate in case you did not understand. Christ has been presented to the world in a veiled threat of condemnation. Oh, you're quiet now, huh? There is now no condemnation.
365 times is the phrase fear not. One fear. But people will, people will say, but man of God, if, 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 we don't scare, if we don't scare the hell out of them, how are they going to align? As if that is what we were sent to do. We were not sent to exteriorly align people to our religious agenda. We were sent to announce the actuality of the Son of God restituting the icon of the Holy Trinity imprinted upon the human nature and that humanity is taken out of the state of delusion that was introduced into the world by Adam's fall and taken out of disease, decay and death. We have been brought into the kind of life which God has always intended. And the reason why it's called good news and not good probability is because it's already true of you when you hear it announced to you. You can deny it. You can accept it. But it doesn't change the fact that is the truth. You can believe and receive and doubt and do without. But the truth is that even when you doubt, it's still true about you. what's already true about you why deprive yourself from what God already said is true about you because let me remind you you are what God says you are you're not what man says you are you're not even what religion says you are you're not what the traditions of men say you are Therefore now, no condemnation. No condemnation is in the emphatic negative, which would read in English thus. Therefore now, no, not now, not ever. Not now, not ever. Shh. 
shall there be any trace of condemnation whatsoever. Let's come to the understanding of what is condemnation. It's the word kataklima, which is a damnatory sentence. And a damnatory sentence implies the expectation of evil. The man who lives in condemnation is waiting for something wrong to happen. And like Job, when it happens, we say, what I have feared has finally come upon. We were not called to be motivated by the fear factor. You have not received the spirit of bondage again unto fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption, the spirit of his son. Crying out in your heart, Abba Father. Let me tell you something you may not know. In the culture of the first century world, it was, it was forbidden for the servants to call their masters Abba. It was forbidden. So if you were not of the genealogical lineage, if you were not recognized by an adoption ceremony, you couldn't call your master Abba if he was a man or Amma if, he, if she were a woman. So he says, we've received the spirit of his son affirming our sonship, endorsing our sonship. Whereby we call Abba Father. We cry it out because it's a realization that if I have the right to call him father, it's because I'm participating in his nature. So to live with a sense of condemnation is to expect adversity as a result of failure. And that is the motivation of most Christians in the theological structures they've received. They're motivated by fear. Those are the three ways a person can be uh, motivated. A person can be motivated either by fear of adversity or expectation of reward. That is the only realm many Christians are motivated in. That one day, all I want to hear is good and uh, <laughs> well done, good and faithful servant. You see, Paul says, study to show yourself approved unto God. If I am not already aware of his approval of me now, that he's well pleased with me now, I will not be able to serve appropriately to hear well done, good and faithful servant then. I study to show myself that I am the approved of God. <laughs> because if not, you, you're going to minister 
with uh, the motivation of fear or even the motivation of expectation of reward. You mean we shouldn't be motivated by those? No. We're not called to be motivated by those. The next realm of motivation is competition. Are motivated by comparison. That I want to be better than so and so. I want to have more than so and so. I want to have a bigger mega church. Praise God. The problem is that people have measured the church in terms of numbers, in terms of quantity, and not in terms of quality. Nothing wrong with the mega church, but it has to be the right sense of mega. We're raising a megaton Caris church. <laughs> so people either serve from the fear of adversity or the fear of failure or the fear of punishment or they're now motivated by the expectation of reward. Either that is the realm from which they're motivated, or they're now motivated by competition. The purest, most spontaneous motivation is to be motivated from the realm of love. Now, I'm telling you, If your child were in need of help, you don't need someone to come and tell you to do something. Spontaneously, the love responds. So why have we believed that unless we have little sprinkles of condemnation in our message? <laughs> Little sprinkles of condemnation. Uh, the people of God won't be aligned. <laughs> Therefore, now, no condemnation. So in Christ is the decisive conclusion... that no person ought to fear to receive an adverse sentence from the Father. So kataklima would mean from here things only go downward. <laughs> Such as uh, the condemnation of a building. In many parts of the world where you have building regulations, if the building is not approved, they condemn the building. And when that mark is put on the building, it means it's, it's, you can, the building is, can only go down. Nothing can be done. The building is only going to go down. So even if you see it standing, it's going to go down. So to live with condemnation, implies you have that expectation of impending doom. Now, we're going to see the context of what he's saying. And when we see the context of what he's saying, we're going to ask ourselves a very vital question. 
and allow me to stretch grammar a little bit. Could the gospel be gooder? Could the gospel be gooder than we have thought it to be? Now, it says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. When we read this term flesh, Paul's going to explain to us what it means. And we need to pay close attention. Because most people presuppose that flesh refers to your body. And people say, for instance, that well, we have problems with this flesh. We, we have all our problems are, are this flesh. Well, your body is not necessarily the flesh. In Romans chapter 8, the flesh is an operating system where the person perceives himself as an independent entity from God and he's trying to externally conform to the law by means of his willpower we're not called to walk in the flesh your resources are not external to you there is a law that has been enacted in the resurrection of Jesus Christ that pertains to what Jesus did with our humanity as certified by his resurrection. And that now means we walk in the spirit. We have a new operating system which is the life of the son reenacted in us by the breath that we now breathe in him. <laughs> you still there? For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath Tenses. Tell someone tenses. tenses. Hath made me free. Listen, you are made free. Made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, the law of sin and death is not referring to the law of Mo Moses, per se. No. The law of sin and death also referred to a vital principle which was enacted in the disobedience of Adam. I've heard that Jesus sets us free from sin. Here Paul tells us he set us free from the law of sin and death. Whoa. So this is the science of emancipation. We are the made free. An alternative translation from the Greek. The vital principle of the breath of life in Christ Jesus. 
So it's referring to the breath that Christ Jesus is breathing post-resurrection. The vital principle of the breath of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the principle of failure, mark missing, and death. You see, Christ invaded the world with God's life. And this changes everything. Because I need to remind you of something. The term resurrection, anastasis, means to stand up again. Literally, to reverse the fall. To be born of God means you're disconnected from any notion of the fall. But we've heard a message that has given us a reference to fallenness to the point that we believe by faith that we are sinners. If you have a sin nature, if you believe you have a sin nature, you will sin by faith. Is, that's inversing the law of faith, man. You, you lose, you're using the law of faith against you. So many people just take it as a given that they are a sinner. So the life evidenced in the true humanity of Jesus Christ at his resurrection is that liberating force that has disentangled us from corruption and mortality. So this is a governing principle manifested in Christ's resurrection which is manifest in you. The spirit of life, the breath of life, breath is a term pneuma, the breath of God, the spirit of God in the Greek and as well in the Hebrew is referred to as uh, the breath of God. Ruach HaKodesh refers to the breath of God. Pneuma Hagion refers to the holy, sanctifying breath of God. We're referring to the personhood of the Holy Spirit, but we're also referring to the effect of that person within us. The indwelling of the Spirit means you're alive. The indwelling of the Spirit means you're breathing God's breath. You see, the quality of your life is determined by what kind of breath you're breathing. It's time for someone to breathe. the Christified air. The vital principle of the breath of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ in other words, Jesus Christ in his actuality has set me free, has exempted me, has liberated me.
from the vital principle of Mark missing. So, what made humanity to miss the mark? Was that we acted on like the source of our image. Now the source of that image came to imprint the image on our nature. And the archetype became prototype in one person. As the hypostatic union. The divine person of the Son takes on our human nature to unite the human nature to His one divine person. You know what that means? You can't speak of humanity apart from the person of Jesus Christ. He has given high definition of our true humanity. And we're now called to renounce whatever is unlike Him. Because whatever is unlike Him is not what we are. Is missing the mark. You're living beneath your vocation. If it's unlike Christ. So all who participate uh, all who partake rather of the human nature are represented in Christ because in his divine person he takes on human nature so it's about to define flesh for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Now here the law is referring to the Mosaic law. Which was given in a parenthesis at Mount Sinai. Until the arrival of the seed. To whom the promises were, were made. So the Mosaic law was ineffectual. Through the false sense of independence that entered into the world due to Adam's sin. So the law didn't have any power. The word ineffectual here also means sick in the Greek. The law was sick. It was infirm, is the word. It was unable to aid. So the Mosaic law found the task impossible. It was impotent. So the impotence of the law, within it kept making humanity sick, feeble, through flesh. So flesh is a, an independent self-oriented system where I do in order to become. So when they say you're walking in the flesh, what would they refer to? You're living in an operating system where you are erroneously viewing yourself independent, relying on an external source to do in order to become. So that describes what most people call living. So they're in an operation system called the flesh. So God commissioned his son as his apostle 
to come and encircle the whole realm of human failure. Because humans fail to recognize what God said they are. Because in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh. The Word didn't just become human. The Word entered into the realm of our delusions. He entered into our operating system. In the likeness of sinful flesh. In the very place where Adam fell. But just as how uh, light cannot be extinguished by darkness, he's able to enter into the very place we fell without being affected by sin. So guess what? He hungers like us. He's tempted like us at all points. But he does not lose the notion that he is the Son of God. He does not embrace a distorted notion of his Father. He does not embrace a distorted identity of himself. He does not rely on an external resource. So what did he do? The principle of sin and death that was within the human nature, he assumes the likeness of sinful flesh to condemn sin while in the flesh. So he entered the belly of the beast to explode the whole system up. <laughs> he encircled human failure to address the issue of missing the mark. And from within his own humanity, he reverses the fall. So that shows you what happened in his resurrection. Amen. In his resurrection, Jesus Christ is revealing, is portraying man as God intended. The archetype is the prototype. And in that event of the, of the new creation, the resurrection, he inaugurates the new creation. That is the God kind of mankind. Tell someone you are the God kind of mankind. So sin has been condemned. in the flesh of Jesus Christ. Remember, he was born under the law. And when he died, the law was fulfilled. And as the law was fulfilled, it was, it was ended. The whole system was ended in the Son of God at his death upon the cross. That the righteousness of the law may be fulfilled in us. You're missing the whole part of the verse. In the Old Testament, 
they were depending on doing something in order to fulfill the law and then be called righteous. Jesus in his resurrection fulfills the law so that righteousness is fulfilled in us. Righteousness Righteousness is what you and I are. We're as righteous as God. Righteousness is implanted into you. Now he says, who walk not after the flesh, uh -huh, but after the spirit. Because of the breath of life breathed by Jesus Christ today, that breathing of the post-resurrection of Jesus Christ, principle concerning me, that I am exempt from the principle of sin and death. The breath of life breathed by the post-resurrection Jesus is the evidence that I have been exempted from mark missing and decay. What if, I said, what if, what if we would acknowledge that we're not just made righteous, but we understand what it means to be made righteous, exempt from not just disease, exempt from decay, corruption, corrosion and death what if so this is what he says now our day-to-day -day lives confirm that we are righteous. What the law pointed to but could not deliver is now fulfilled in us. What the law pointed to but could not deliver. You see, the law pointed to a future time. The prophets predicted a future time. In fact, the reason why in the Old Testament they were always expecting and always anticipating was because they knew there was coming the day of fulfillment. Remember what the Samaritan woman said, when Messiah comes, he shall teach us these things. They were waiting for the time of fulfillment. And in that time of fulfillment, there would be a rectification. All their errors would be rectified. Because he is the great teacher. But let me tell you how he teaches us. He didn't teach us by giving us a lesson. He teaches us by sharing his own life with us. So this salvation is a didactic re-education from the inside of our humanity. He re-educates us in a new way of being human. And the righteousness of the law is now fulfilled in us. Okay, the rest of tonight we're going to look at verse 5 and verse 6. Are you ready? Amen. 
he begins to explain, he continues to explain the terminology is flesh and spirit. Because in, in charismatic circles, you know, this being in the spirit, we've, we've, li we've limited that to, you know, the, the charismata, you know, singing in tongues and praising God and worshiping. Wow, they are in the spirit. Well, you, you can't do that kind of spirit 24-7. If that, if that is being in the spirit, if, if that's the only definition of being in the spirit, there are many domains in which we will not be in the spirit. No, but you can be in the spirit and fulfill your vocation in every realm of life. Because being in the spirit is not necessarily just the charismatic operations of the spirit. It includes that, but not limited to that. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. The phrase do mind refers to mind set. Mind set. which is a term phronema. So there's a way of seeing, an outlook, a worldview, vision, that becomes a way of being. Remember, flesh is having a do-to-be worldview. If I do this, then I will become that. It's an operating system based on the false notion of an independent self. Where you're living by your own resources. That if I do this, I will become that. A do-to-be paradigm. That, that's what it means to live in the flesh. The flesh is an inversion of our awareness. Being in the spirit is that way of seeing, that outlook, that worldview, that vision, whereby through our co-inherence with Christ, if Jesus Christ is in you, and He is, then the vital principle of the breath of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the vital principle of sin and death. Did you get that? So I have, we have, in this law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, an internal cooperating participation. Remember, it's the term mindset. So we see verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death. So he's explaining the law of sin and death. How does it operate? Through a mindset. And to have that mindset is death. 
So this is where there has to be renewal in how we have been operating. Right? To lead by right thinking. So, uh, you need to know whose you are, who you are, but apart from that, you need to know from whence you are looking and what your attention is on. You're still there. Being spiritually minded is life and peace, is life and harmonium, is life and wholeness. So your wholeness is experienced through your mindset. Your outlook, your worldview, your vision, your way of seeing sets the pattern to your way of being. It's called the, the economy of persuasion. It's called the link between the ontic and the noetic. The ontic is the nature, the noetic is what you nurture through your mind. Hmm. So our awareness becomes our experience. So as long as we're thinking do to be, well, we'll never experience what we are in the now. As long as we're thinking one day, we will never experience it in the now. See, the, the gospel comes to unfold what has always been. That's why it speaks of reconciliation. It speaks of redemption. Restoration. It speaks of being uh, to remember Whoa. and to recover Father. and Father. to revive Father. and to restitute. Father. So there is what has always been true, intact, fixed, permanent in the mind of God. So our experience of what is in God's mind is determined by what is in our mind. What is true of you must become true to you. And there has to be an agreement between God's mind and your mind. And awareness is manifestation. So what are you aware of now? That is your manifestation. 
That is why to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Let us stand to our feet. Lift up your holy hands. <laughs> we will continue tomorrow. Sapratafarita sigadia itang zakia. We thank you, Father, for transformation. We thank you that it's not a matter of time. It's a matter of revelation. It's a matter of what we see. It's a matter of what we perceive. It's a matter of what we know and of who we know. Lift up your holy hands and pray one more time. We thank you that we are being enabled to see clearly, to look intently. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the manifestation of what we are. In Christ Jesus, and the sons of God said, Amen. Amen. Now, you know what I'm about to say, right? If you want to shout, you shout. Thank you, Lord. Your awareness is manifestation. Listen, if you are relying on something external to become what God says about you, the result of that is death. If you're still looking for something to become what God says you are, the result of that is death. But if you acknowledge you live in union, with the breath of life being breathed by Jesus Christ. You are exempt from the law of sin and death. It is life and peace. Your awareness is manifestation. We're learning how to be whole. I said, we're learning how to be whole. We're learning the art of being whole. Thank you, Lord. Take a seat. So, <laughs> we are starting the year strong. Amen. And, and the good news is gooder. Inverted commas open and close. Gospel is gooder. Change is not a matter of time. A 
it's a matter of revelation. It's a matter of what you are seeing. So we're going to continue on this tomorrow. You still there? Amen. Wholeness is happening. You, you want to know why wholeness is happening? Because your view is adjusting. The, the vitality is becoming the reality. So, I will not necessarily pray in a conventional sense. But you will notice that ever since you came here, and as you heard intently, and as you fix your gaze in the mirror to see the actual image of the prototype sun, and you identified yourself as the replication of the prototype, you realize this is who I am. You're walking in your liberty. You're walking in your freedom. You will realize that afflictions have left you. Bondages will lift from you. Because by the spirit of life, God is breathing this word into you. And let me tell you what will happen. Experientially, everything's about to change. Everything. Everything. Let, let me drop something before I leave. The Holy Spirit came to minister to the whole man, but particularly he is focused on your mind. He has come to show you all things that you were freely given in grace. Why? Ask me why. Because if I become aware of what was given beforehand in grace, I will experience what was given to me. It's not that God has to do something. Come on, somebody. It's not that God has to do something. It's not that something has to happen is that you need to become aware of what already belongs to you. You need to become aware of whose you are, of who you are, of what belongs to you because of who you belong to. ministry of the spirit remember what Jesus said he will declare unto you that which belongs to me things pertaining to myself 
I like what the Amplified Bible says. It said he will declare, testify, declare, declose, and transmit. He will declare, he will disclose, he will transmit. There's a transmission happening right now. Because as it's being disclosed to you, it's what was always yours. As it's being declared to you, it's being transmitted into your life. Your experience, your experience is about to upgrade to Christ's reality. You can only be the son that you are. Somebody celebrate tonight. Glory to God. We Dr. Annie and myself have seen the power of God throughout the world. And in fact, at the very beginning of this ministry, we used to hold what are called the Balm of Gilead meetings. Yeah, from boarding school. The Balm of Gilead. And we were focusing on healing and uh, operations of the miraculous. Let me tell you, there's, there's a point where a person experiences their healing. It is at that moment where their attention shifts from the affliction to Christ. See, there's a moment. Everyone who eventually experiences their healing, there was a moment where the attention shifted from what they thought their problem was. And the moment there was that shift of attention, the power of God was transmitted. You're about to experience an upgrade in Christ. I said, I'm not, I'm not going to pray in a conventional way, but it's an apostolic way. I just want you to close your eyes. And I'm going to ask you to take a deep breath. Breathe in and breathe out. And we're going to do it this time. You're going to do it in a state of rest. You're going to breathe in and breathe out. And we're going to do it one more time. We're going to breathe in and breathe out. Listen, the breath of life in Christ Jesus. has set me free from the law of sin and death. That is the breath of zoification. The breath of Christification. Your experience is being changed. And I'm going to ask you <laughs> to shift 
any preoccupation. Stop seeing it as it has to happen and acknowledge what has already happened. You are whole. You are in harmony with life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, man. You may be seated for one moment. You're being made whole. Learn to laugh. Laughter is a good medicine. Shagabramba Bhavi. Shadiyai Bhavi. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord. Abba Father. Thank you, Lord. Listen. God is breathing inside of you. Are becoming aware of what it is to be alive in him. Glory. Thank you, Lord. Well, I'm going to say something I'm hearing the Lord say. You who were timid to laugh in church, as you're going home tonight, There will be an outbreak of joy and laughter. And your family won't have the context to why you were laughing. <laughs> Glory to God. Well, you know, can I tell you something? Let me come down there and tell you something. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Christians, Christians pray for another Pentecost all the time. And then they get offended when it actually happens. Because what happened on the day of Pentecost? They didn't just speak in tongues. No, I'm explaining this to those who think it's a strange thing. When the Jews saw the 120, they said they are drunk with new wine. That this kind is a new kind. 
that is not what we know is a new kind. And then Peter explained to them, they are not drunk as you suppose. Which means that they were under the influence. I know that there are a lot of timid ones here. <laughs> but the Lord is making you whole. Disease leaves you. It's leaving your body. All those symptoms are going to go. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Shevla Vamalatia. Glory. 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 What do you think will happen by the end of this week? Thank you, Father. You are blessed with all blessings. Amen. So they're just going to put the basket in front for those of you who want to show generosity tonight. And if you're watching us online, you can connect with our various modalities of giving. We're going to be online this week. We trust that you are being blessed. We'll see you same time tomorrow. All that indwells Jesus Christ, all that indwells Jesus the Christ preserves and prospers you. When people would celebrate in the ancient world, and there would be such joy manifested that miracles happen. Et qu'il y aurait une telle joie manifestée au point où les miracles se, se produisaient. The people present knew that was an indicator. Les gens présents savaient que c'était là un indicateur of the presence of the divine. De la présence du divin. Listen. Écoutez. Strange occurrences des, des étranges manifestations of the miraculous du miraculeux who attest vont attester the miracle the, the era of God causing men to work with angels de l'ère où Dieu amène les hommes à marcher avec les anges And so such festivals festival were called Panegyris. Panegyris. P-A-N-E-G-Y-R-I-S.
partnership with the invisible. The angels of God are joining the ecclesia in our nation. As we enter this sensitive decade, before Horizon 2033, which will be the year, my 30th year in ministry. It's not a coincidence. I said it's not a coincidence. He's taking you from victory to victory. From strength to strength. From height to height. From grace to grace. From grace to grace. Honor to honor. Because we will have the best of both worlds. Gathered in one. Gathered in earthly places. I said heaven in earthly places. Panegyrus 2023. Why? 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 It's the era of men working with angels. Les hommes qui marchent avec les anges. 